Hello and welcome to Let's Talk Music Tech Masterclass Sessions here at Staffordshire University in aid of Nordoff Robbins, the UK's leading music therapy charity. Now we've got three guests today. Uh, okay. Our first speaker today has been a musician and songwriter for nearly 20 years, releasing six albums with his bands Ten and Hard Rain. He is also currently working on his second solo album titled Faith of the Crow, which is going to be released sometime during this year. Please welcome Paul Hudson. First of all, thank you very much for saying that I've only been in the industry for 20 years because that makes me seem a little bit younger. Uh, it's actually 30 years this year that I've, I've been involved um, uh, in the music industry. Um, what I wanted to do was just sort of give a little bit of a, an overview of sort of the music industry and how we, how as musicians, we try to exist in there and how we go about trying to exist within the industry. Um, it's, it's not an easy industry to get into and it's not an easy industry to, to stay in once you are actually there. Um, but then I suppose that that's, that's the case with, with every industry, I suppose. Um, so, well, I suppose a little bit about, about what I've done. It's actually 30 years that I've been in the, the music industry uh, this year. Um, so far, I've got 47 album or single credits, uh, whether that's a producer, as an engineer, as a, a, a musician. Um, toured all over the place. Um, my favourite place being, uh, being Japan. I've done uh, a couple of tours in Japan, which were, were, were absolutely fabulous with um, some various people, a guy called Bob Cowley from Magnum, um, the, 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 the band that I used to be in, a uh, band called Ten, my solo projects. But I've also toured with, with people like Bob Geldof, um, Robert Plant, lo lots of sort of different, uh, different artists over the years. Um, also a member of things, um, I'm a, a songwriter, I'm a, a registered songwriter with, with PRS, MCPS Alliance, so uh, once in a while they actually give me some money um, for, for, uh, for writing uh, on albums that I've done over the years. Um, not going to go into uh, to all of my work. There's, there's sort of uh, various bits and pieces there. Um, I suppose the of of all of the work that I've uh, that I've done, I suppose the one there with uh, John Parr was was particularly um, uh, enjoyable. John is um, um, uh, a Grammy uh, a Grammy nominated uh, songwriter who had a, a hit uh, in the States that went to number one uh, called Saint Elmo's Fire. Um, it was also the theme tune to a, uh, to a film of, of the same name. Um, also worked with uh, a guy called Harold Faltemeyer on that album, who um, a, he is a, um, a Grammy Award winner. Um, he did the soundtrack for things like Top Gun and, and sort of various other, other films. Um, but unfortunately, he's best known for The Crazy Frog. I bet you d you're too young to remember that, aren't you? Yes, you are. No, you're not. Yes, you are. Some of you are. Um, yeah, he was. Um, he, that was kind of um, that song called Axel. Uh, it was called Axel F. Was probably his his, his biggest things. Um, I'm not going to go through through um, my whole discography because, as I say, a lot of it is um, is is still out. Well, it's still out there and and uh, uh, and earning. Um, Recent, uh, recent. That's sort of, I suppose, the most recent album that I've done. Reach uh, a, an album called Storm Warning. Reach number eighteen in the Japanese charts, which I was really, really pleased about. Uh, the video that we did has had uh, just over thirty-eight thousand hits on YouTube, so we, we've we've done quite well. Um, my solo album um, didn't quite do quite as well. Twenty in the national charts in, in, the, in Japan, but I did actually, um, I think I got to number one in the HMV rock charts uh, with, with their album in 2004. Um, and that album was signed to a company called Frontier, so I was, I was in, um, signed to the same label as people like Death Leopard, Whitesnake, Toto, Journey, so you know, some, some, some uh, good artists uh, signed to that label. Um, and that one, as I say, that's probably one of the um, one of the albums that have probably sold that I've that I've worked on that has probably sold the most. 
Um, don't know the exact figures, but as I say, John was very, very big in the States. Uh, and it was great to work with, with Harold Faltermeyer on, on that album. He's, he's uh, you know, a little bit of a hero of mine. Um, I suppose a little bit about the music industry in general. I've, I've got there, is there still uh, a music industry? Um, and I think at this point, what I should be doing is being the grumpy old man and saying, oh, it's, it's, it's not like it used to be um, when I started in the industry 30 years ago. And in actual fact, I'm really glad that it isn't the same as, as the industry was 30 years ago because it, it's, it's a completely different game now. Um, we definitely, as musicians, as artists, I think we're definitely in a slightly better situation than perhaps we were sort of in the 80s, in the 70s and the 80s, and, and throughout the 90s, I suppose, in as much as that we're, we're slightly more empowered, okay? We can do slightly more as artists uh, and not have to, to, to sort of worry about the music industry as such. A um, little bit of a background, in 2010, UK creative industries, and, and I'm putting a, sort of a, a broad sense around that, I'm not just talking about the music industry, but the film industry, the computer games industry, because, of course, we're still doing the music for that kind of thing, um, exported 4.1% of all goods and services of this country, and we made somewhere in the region of £17.3 billion for our economy. Okay. Um, the reason why I tell people that is because everybody who goes into the music industry, the first thing that they do, or, or first thing that their parents generally tell them is, get yourself a proper job. Well, it is a proper job. It is a proper industry. We do very, very well for this country. Um, 2010, again, creative industries employed somewhere in the region of 1.3 million people in 182,000 different businesses which is approximately 8.7% uh, 8, 8 of all enterprise in this country. So we are a credible, we are a credible industry, okay? Um, the problems, the downside that we have to do or we have to face and exist within the music industry is that we are still um, suffering from illegal downloading. Illegal downloading, we know is, is obviously still happening. Um, the problem is, is that we simply don't know how much as artists it's affecting us. Because the, it's very, very difficult to, um, to quantify and qualify how big an impact that it's having on us. Um, 2008, the, uh, in eight, um, the International Federation of Phonographic Industries claimed in 2008 that 95% of all downloads were illegal. Okay, so that's only 5% of the industry which was legitimate. Um, I don't know how they've quantified those figures. I really, really don't. And I would, I would probably say that without sort of a, a definite quali uh, qualification of those figures, I'm not entirely convinced that, that that is specifically true. It is suggested that um, nowadays, in England, approximately 75% of all music uh, and films, you mustn't forget that as well, um, of media is downloaded illegally. Okay? Again, very, very difficult to quantify these figures. Um, I sometimes wonder whether some of these figures are actually hyped. It is estimated, however, that the illegal downloading is costing the industry somewhere in the region of 545 million sorry, billion pounds per year. So it's an awful lot of money. We, we, again, you know, where these figures come from, it's very, very difficult to, to, to qualify. Um, the good thing is, is that I suppose your age group have been able to, to, to develop the thing that I suppose is almost putting some of us out of work anyway, which is the internet. Um, so due to the, so the, the development of social media, um, I think that what has happened is that the music industry and us as artists are controlled more by the fans than we used to be controlled by the record companies. Okay? 
Frontiers Records, the label that um, I've released all the 10 albums through my solo album, started off as, as two guys who were just fans of music. And they got a little bit of money and they wanted to invest into the kind of music that they enjoyed. And they're now probably, well, they are one of the biggest sort of rock labels in the whole of, certainly in the whole of Europe. Um, you know, you don't get people like Def Leppard or White Snake on your label if, if you're not a big company, and those are the kind of people that they're dealing with. Um, so I think that what we've done is that we've come away from the big record companies and the big all-empowering record companies, even though that they're still uh, playing a big role within what we do, it's all coming back, it's, it's all sort of downsizing. And I think because of the internet and because we can and we've got so much social media that, that it's, it's a, lot of, a lot of what we sell now is more fan-based rather than, as I say, the big majors still attacking and finding the markets and, and pushing us into markets. Um, I think it has become a cottage industry, um, probably even more so than, than in the 80s where um, there was the development of, of an awful lot of these independent record labels. We can all be our own record label. Um, certainly for my next album, I'm not even sure whether I'm going to go with a record label because I can't think of anything that they can, they can do that I can't do myself. The only thing that they have an awful lot more is, is, is time. But even the contacts and, and an awful lot of the, the, the way that they sell their music are based around internet portals, of which I know a lot of those people. And as musicians, we grow to know these people anyway. So I think that the, the, the era of, uh, of, of the record label um, is actually on the wane. The problem that we have is that we have to understand the kind of people and the buying habits, if you will, of the kind of people that we're likely to sell into. It would be great to think that, you know, I wouldn't have to press a CD, but the kind of people who buy my CDs are my age and probably don't do sort of downloading albums. They just don't trust that technology. So a, a little bit of it, as I say, it has become a, a cottage industry that we as musicians can empower and can control now, I think, which is, I, th I think is a, a, a real sort of a boom. So we are, we do seem to be an awful lot more in control nowadays. I think that's, that's a, a, a big positive now. We are in control. Less and less people are telling us what we should be doing, which gives us then time to develop and, and do what we do, which is create music and produce music. Um, I've got there that, that we're no longer controlled by the big labels. Obviously, that there are times that the big labels are going to be needed. Okay. Um, I went to uh, a symposium just before, uh, well, it was sort of, sort of October time uh, last year, uh, and one of the, the guest speakers there was a, a guy called Muff Winwood, um, who was a very, very big um, A&R man in, in the sort of the 70s and the 80s. Uh, and he was sort of saying, well, you know, a, a lot of the advances being paid to, uh, by the big labels generally at the moment seem to be going down the boy band route, or I suppose the girl band route, purely for the fact that they know that it's going to sell. They know that the areas that they can, they can push, and they know that that's going to sell. In order to get a boy band, a new artist, um, actually broken, selling records, he seems to estimate he's costing the big labels a million pounds just to break one artist, okay? The advances that these people are being paid are somewhere in the region of about between 115 to 200,000 pounds as the advance, which sounds like an awful lot of money, but when you think about it, if there's four people in the band, that's 50,000 pounds each, and generally speaking, they're going to be tied up for two years in order to promote and, and try and develop their career. So, you know, they're earning £25,000 a year. It doesn't seem like an awful lot of money when you put it into, into that context. Um, so although as artists, yeah, we'd love these, these big figures, generally speaking, the figures that they're getting aren't that big anyway. You know, it's, it's not, they're not big, uh, big amounts. Um, I think 
the bias has gone away from dealing with sort of the, the big all all empowering labels to smaller trends to to tech companies as I call them um, which are probably have got as, as big a control on the market as the, the big labels okay I would imagine the majority of the people in this room or, or in the university indeed probably buy stuff from from things like iTunes and Napster we get our music we listen to our music from Spotify from YouTube etc so I think that where we've we've sort of got the power back from the big labels we're also having to think about all of these smaller smaller big labels as it were these 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 new tech areas of, of industry um, I've written that that their musicians don't understand music should be free for everyone okay um, again in this symposium that I was in at last year um, I was speaking to somebody who was um, don't really know anything about him he's from Holland but he was kind of developing a sort of a Spotify type of uh, business um, and I came out feeling as if I was some kind of old relic which which I know I am but 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 I, I actually felt very 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 sort of deflated because basically what he was saying was that you know people expect something for nothing you know they expect music now to be free because we can go on Spotify we can just put in our favorite tunes and we can listen to them for nothing okay we can do the same with YouTube we can do the same with 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 whatever we can go and get music for nothing um, and I actually got got the sort of the feeling that this guy actually believed that that was right and I, I, I don't you know let's let's take the step further then um, for those who know me most people would know that I'm quite partial to beer so let's make beer free that's that's my my idea it's still a product okay we are a product the product that we sell is music but at the end of the day we are a product we are a, a can of beer we're a soap powder we're a clothes peg we are just a product that we sell okay and I believe that for for the work that I do um, and the work that we all do as artists as producers as engineers that we should be paid for it I know it's quite an old-fashioned sort of uh, 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 way of thinking but at the end of the day music is a product okay and therefore we should be paid for that for that product um, I've also heard the quote, and, and I'm sure many of you have also heard it, musicians are making less money nowadays, but the technology used to make our product is getting cheaper, so by and large, we're doing okay. Well, I don't see the cost of CDs coming down, and I don't think the cost of Pro Tools is coming down, so I'm just wondering who on, who, you know, why that sort of statement is being bandied about we're not doing okay yes you're absolutely right the amount of money that we're getting for albums is coming down okay our advances are dropping rapidly okay we could also argue that the fact that the industry um, is is doing that because the industry aren't doing isn't doing very well I'm, I'm not entirely sure that that's the case nowadays because largely the industry doesn't have to press CDs anymore because for the majority of our work it goes straight onto YouTube or, or it goes onto things like iTunes or we, d or we download, our, uh, download our music digitally so I'm not entirely sure that that can, that can hold out either okay. um, the thing that I find is that music is labour intensive for us to create records, for us to create music, it's very, very labour intensive and the, the technology isn't helping that labour intensive element of, of our work, of our product. Okay? Computers aren't going to help us with that, so we're being paid largely for our time okay? and that hasn't really changed a huge amount, I don't think anyway. Um, I also feel that 
it should be us as musicians to decide what it is that we give away for promotional use. Okay. Um, I think my, my album, my f the, the, the solo album, I actually got um, a copy of, of my album from a torrent site before the album was released. So somebody from the record company or somebody must have just put that on there. Um, I, and I've, I've no idea who did that. There was only two people that had that, that uh, record at the time. That was myself and the record label. And it was torrented before it was even released. I'm not over keen on that idea, and I'm sure you as, as artists would, would, would also agree that that's, um, that's not a good idea. Um, how to succeed as an artist? I have no idea. Um, I've been very, very fortunate in as much as that for 30 years I've made um, money, if you will, out of the industry, and I've existed in the industry. And, you know, since I came here sort of full-time seven, eight years ago, that was my job. You know, making music was the way that I paid for my mortgage. So, how to succeed nowadays, well, it prob it'll probably compl be completely different to my experiences um, nowadays because, you know, the industry is, is changing. It's very difficult to in, uh, exist in the industry, or, or I suppose any industry, without fully understanding the way that, that the industry works. Okay, so you need a good round view of that industry to understand what's going on, okay? Um, as I said earlier, it is a business. We would love to art ourselves up to say that we're creative people and, you know, we're, we're sensitive and, and all of this lot. At the end of the day, it's a, it's a business. As far as I'm aware, I don't have a registered charity number tattooed across my head. I, I do it for money. I enjoy doing it, I'm making a product that, I'm, that I enjoy making, but at the end of the day, I'm a product. But in order for me to, to exist by selling a product, maybe what I've had to do over the years is diversify that product. And I think everybody has to understand that that's, that's something that, that you need to do anyway. So you need to be prepared to diversify a little bit and, and to change your, your product. Um, I think the great thing is nowadays is that nobody's telling us what to do. You know, our record companies, I never got any calls from my record company saying, oh yeah, we want it mixed in this way, we want it mixed in that way. They just trust me to get on with it and, and do it. The only problem is, is that they leave me alone and do it and, and I just don't get round to doing anything very much because unless the pressure is there in order to get you creative, it's actually very, very difficult to finish a product. Okay, I'm sure we've all done that, you know, well, we, we think that we've finished this song, but then we spend the next six months tweaking it because, and it doesn't get any better, it just gets different, I think. Um, so I think that people breathing down their neck is actually a good thing at times. Um, I think the other thing to, to reach success is to understand that you're not going to be rich and successful overnight. Um, and you shouldn't expect to be because it's just a business. If we have the look of success, that's brilliant. But I think if we can just make a living, that's, that's, that's a bonus. Okay, I think that's a, a, a very important thing to remember. Um, my journey, I suppose, um, I suppose how I did it really is, is that I understood that it was wrong to specialise. Um, certainly from at the beginning, of my career because if I just said, right, um, all I'm going to do is work in studios, I would never have earned a living. If I just said, all I'm going to do is play keyboards or sing, I would never have earned a li living. If I'd have just said, I'm going to be a producer, I would never have earned a living. Putting all of those things together makes a living. So I think that we've got to do, uh, and we've got to be very, very diverse in our skill sets, okay? Which is where, obviously, university education is helping you because we're trying to give you all of these diverse skills. Um, my, um, my, I suppose that the thing that I've always lived by is that when the phone goes and somebody asks you to do something, the answer is yes. Even if the answer is no, you can always mould it so as that the answer seems as if it's yes. Okay? We've got to be able to do everything as artists. We, we have to do it. If, if it's producing an album, brilliant. 
if it's doing the sound for a computer game. It's still music. We have to be able to exist in lots of different areas of the media nowadays in order to be a successful artist, I think. Um, I suppose then um, I learned to follow where the work was. You know, you actively go out and find the areas where something is going to work for you, an area which is going to be commercial. And you don't always know that straight from the off offset. You, you, you just kind of find a niche and then that's where you go. That's the time really, I suppose, um, that, that you can become a little bit specialised. And the, the thing that I always say, that, that commercial and money, they're not dirty words. We are a business. I keep on saying this, we are a business. Um, I also realise the value of a, a, of a contact, an email address, a name. It's a sale at the end of the day. Generally speaking, if we have 100 contacts from experience, you'll get 10 sales. That's from, from my experience. The more contacts that you have, the more that you can, that you can sort of tie into, um, into people, you're going to probably get some kind of uh, maybe a 10% return. Okay, so the more contacts that you have, the more emails that you have, the more people on your Facebook page, the more chance that you're going to sell some records. Okay, that didn't exist obviously five years ago. Um, I also learnt that commercial exploitation is not a dirty word. Okay, business thrives on it. Again, we are a product to sell. We're not okay. We're artists. We create something that's very, very wonderful. But we are also a business. Please, you know that's that's the thing that I that I remembered. Um, meeting people, networking, um, using your contacts. Learn to spot those people that can do things for you, and those people that can't do things for you, because otherwise you're wasting your time. Okay, and I found that very very early on in, and I I kind of networked with with and, and, and I suppose sucked up to the to the right people. Okay, and it, it did help my career considerably. Um, understanding the market that you're selling into, you have to do that as an artist. I know that if I did my album as digital download only, I wouldn't sell any records. Because people of my age that buy my kind of music, the kind of music that I, that I write and that I perform and I record, they're not going to want to do that. They want to buy physical copy. So by understanding your market, you know how to sell into that market. Um, you can't change your market. Okay? You have to accept it and then work within that market. And as an artist, we all, we all have to do that. Okay? Um, I think that's probably the, the, the biggest thing, is own as much as possible. Don't give anything away. Own your own publishing. Because if somebody's collect collecting your publishing for you, um, they're going to be taking some money from you and you lose control. Always remain in control. Okay? Um, don't make uh, assumptions that industry experts know what they're doing because some of them don't. Okay? Um, it's also better to sign with a smaller label for that reason, uh, a smaller label of people that know what they're doing than a larger label of people who don't. Okay, but again, that's, that's just a, a little bit of experience. Um, understand the, the, uh, the, the, sort of the, the industry, the mechanics, how it works, and know your place within that, that market. Okay? That's kind of tying in with, with what I said earlier. Um, and always measure the value and, and really value customers because they are the people who are going to be paying your rent and your mortgage. Okay? So you know, give them what they want. Um, make sure that you, that you remain customer-centred. Uh, um, I always didn't sell, or I, I tried not, and I still try not, to sell um, a product. Okay? I will sell license for a product. Okay? Um, I, because I don't like the word maybe. Okay? You go into a record label and then you pay them uh, your album and they, and they say, oh yeah, you know, yeah, that's all right, but not sure, not sure. Um, what, what else have you got? Um, maybe or, or not sure, it's not a word that I like. All I prefer to do is go in with a product and say, 
that's what you're having, that's what it's going to be, do you want it or don't you? And then it's either yes or a no. If it's a maybe, I take the CD out and I'll walk out the door because it's not a, a word that I understand. It's not a word um, that, that makes any sense to me. Um, stay in control as much as possible. Again, if you're doing license, selling license, you're much more in control of, of what's happening with, with that album. Um, business is about money and ma about making money. I keep on using money and business and all of that lot, but that's what we are. Um, the record labels want to keep as much of it as they want to. You want to keep as much of it as you can. So the more that you control, the more that you own, the more in control um, the whole system is for you and you will make more money, you'll make a better living. Okay? Because they don't want to give you, the record labels don't want to pass anything back to you as an artist. They just don't want to do it. Um, pitfalls, we end up in business and I'm sure that this is, not the case, this is just not the case with music. We tend to spend more of our time as being accountants, collecting money. Um, get somebody to do that for you. You're a professional uh, musician, not a professional accountant. Okay? Do what you do best, which is the music, and if you can, get other people to do the bits that you don't want to do. Okay? Um, contracts. I have signed several contracts that have just completely stopped me working for long periods of time. Um, my advice to any artist is that if, you, if you're not sure about the contract that you're just about to sign, don't sign it. Okay? And record companies want to do that. They want to tie you up for a long period of time because they want to make money out of you. Okay? Um, it might not be the best thing for you as an artist because they could take your product and just leave it on a shelf for a long period of time. So if in doubt, don't sign. Okay? It's got to be right for you as well as, as the, record, the record label. Um, it's, it's brilliant thinking that, great, I've got a record deal. If it's the wrong record deal, it will be the worst thing that you'll do, I promise you. Um, so therefore, a bad contract signed will put you out of work for many years. So if in doubt, don't sign. Um, so I suppose just to, to conclude, it's a brilliant industry. It's never been so vibrant. It's never been so as a, a, exciting. As an artist, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. Um, but it is an industry, okay? At the end of the day, it is business. It is a, a, an industry. Um, we're, not, we're not any different to anybody else. We're not different to a soap powder or a car, okay? So don't expect to be different, okay? Um, thanks for listening. And I think this is, as this is for, for charity, I suppose I, I should share with you my, my favorite photograph, which is, uh, which is that one. So um, give money, um, and thanks very much for listening. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> so thanks, Paul, for that, that was brilliant. Uh, as he said, this is all for charity, so uh, we'll show you a brief video now of what um, Nordoff Robbins do. Music is something that affects us all. It's something we can't help responding to. We at Nord of Robbins work with people of all ages. We use music to reach through the effects of illness or disability or trauma. Because music reaches right inside a person. And there are Nord of Robbins music therapists working across the country with people living with many different challenges. For example, a major part of our work is with older people living in care homes who have dementia. And we see people benefit enormously who are autistic or who have learning difficulties, people with mental health problems or neurological disorders. 
So when Nordoff Robbins music therapists use music, they can draw even the most withdrawn or disabled person out of themselves and into communication with other people. Music becomes um, a connection or builds a bridge for them.